evening. I'm calling to order the regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, October 27, 2022. I'm Liz Exton, the chair. Permit me to confirm that all mem remote members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey, but I don't see that. Um, Dr. Holman? Here. Mr. Mason? Here. Edson, Edson, sorry. <laughs> Edson, here. Edson. Edson, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Miller? Here. Okay. All right, and we don't have any students left. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted in a hybrid model. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call, provided Dr. Allison Ampey is on the Zoom. Yep, there she is. Um, <clears throat> a number of um, members of the central administration are out of town this week at a Deeper Learning Dozen conference. So Dr. Homan and Mr. Mason are joining us by Zoom, and Dr. McNeil and Ms. Elmer will not be with us this evening, and thank you to Mr. Spiegel for being here in person this evening. Um, before we begin our business this evening, I want to acknowledge the passing of the Arlington Select Board's longstanding administrator, Marie Kropelka, who passed away yesterday. Ms. Kropelka started work for Arlington in 1959, first as clerk and, sten clerk and stenographer in public works then in the town manager's office in the mid-60s as head clerk, working for Arlington's first town manager, Edward Monahan. Over the years, she held roles in community safety and building department inspectional services before taking on the role of select board administrator in September 2001. As board administrator, she assisted the select board in their many duties as well as assisted the public, showing to everyone who visited or called the select board office her deep knowledge of how Arlington government worked. On behalf of the school committee and the Arlington Public Schools, I'd like to extend our deepest sympathy to Marie's family and friends. She will be missed. All right. Um, thank you. The first item on our agenda is public comment, but I believe we do not have anyone for public comment. And I understand that our AHS student reps um, are busy this evening with the music event that is happening. So we will move on to the Arlington High School School Improvement Plan. Dr. Dranger? Dr. Jenger, I am driving slides for the meeting and will do my best to take cues from you or advance when you need me to. Just keep an eye on things and let me know if you need me to go forward or back. That's awesome. No, I mean, and I'm fine if it doesn't work. Just a little easier if I can. Did you want me to start with the school improvement plan? Was that the one we were yeah. doing first? So as I was explaining before uh, we started the meeting, I feel like there's a five minute version of this and a 45 minute version of this, not a 12 minute version. So I'm gonna give the five minute version and then you can direct me back to areas where you have questions about the larger document. Um, so the main focus really that we come to across conversations that I only outline in the school improvement plan and I'll only talk about briefly here are sort of three themes that kept emerging in every conversation that we had last year. Um, and those were around belonging, engagement, and then equitable access to higher level learning. Um, and so I'll go a little bit quickly through some of the data, but 
the sort of overview of that was right that we heard regularly from teachers concerns about sense of connection with each other, connection with students. We see in the panorama survey, as well as a lot of other measures and conversations we're having with students, issues around students just not feeling connected to school um, and you know, feeling disengaged. And there's a lot of obvious reasons for that. We've had the pandemic. We had this period of separation from each other. We kind of lost the habit of, of being together. And the building project um, didn't help. We came back last year very excited about all coming back together again. And yet it took us a fairly long time before we really did all come together in one room because we were still concerned about large assemblies. Um, we still didn't have physical spaces in which to do that. And you know, there are a few times we did. I think the first time we all came together just as a, as a group was when the, um, the classes during the month of December where we had concerts. And I remember speaking to the sophomore class and just saying, this is the first time you guys have been together in a year and a half. And you know, seeing the change in everybody's when we kind of realized, because when they started that meeting, they were all kind of like this. And they were like, this is what we do. We're all in a room together. We enjoy it. You know, we think about what it is we're feeding off of each other. And everybody sat up and we got to that place where it was a lot more positive. So quick run through of just some of the data points. So if you look at the student belonging scale, and this is from last spring, um, you look across all of the scales and the, the lowest scale is the one on the right for belonging. Um, in general, we actually did do pretty well on many of those and we showed improvements in a lot of the areas between the fall and the spring, but belonging remains the lowest level scale. And then putting belonging in high schools in context is a little bit difficult, so I just want to share the next slide, which is actually specific to the classroom level surveys that we did in English and physical science last year. And again, you'll see across um, a group of relatively high scores in English, the lowest two are belonging and engagement. And we interpreted this when we talked during the summer retreat. The, the students actually reported that they felt like the climate in their English classes was really good. And the teachers were very respectful. And they were learning a lot. And they didn't feel connected. And they didn't feel engaged. Um, it's important to put in context that if you go into the deeper recesses on the classroom scale, where they allow you to compare it to not just other people who've taken the survey, but to other schools, that that's actually a relatively high score for belonging in high schools on the panorama scale. Um, and so maybe that says something developmentally about high school students, and maybe that says something developmentally about the structure of high schools, um, and maybe it says something about where we are. Nonetheless, there is no question that for our students and for our staff, focusing on that belonging and engagement with each other and with the content is really important. Um, you can see in the staff reports, again, 60% 60 of student staff reported favorably on the scale. And when you ask, do you belong, 66% reported favorably. But where they reported particularly low was on connection to each other, where only 47% of the staff said that they felt very connected to other adults in their school. Um, so now pivoting to the next question, which is about equitable access to higher learning. We talked a lot last year, so I'm not going to go through it. We've all had that experience um, when we were doing the work around the heterogeneous grouping initiative about the various ways in which the experience of students at different levels, honors versus A, was different in terms of their expect the expectations and relationships they had, and the experiences of students of color, students in special education and ELL students was different in terms of participating in higher level learning um, and in those relationships that then went with the levels. And so you can see here, you know, the differentiation where African American students are half as likely in the selected classes on this slide to participate in honors level curriculum. Um, uh, Hispanic students were about one and a half times, so a little bit more. Um, and then special ed and ELL students were less likely. And that was what led to many of the initiatives we talked about. So going through all of these conversations in the faculty senate, in the uh, instructional leadership team, in the heterogeneous grouping initiative, our instructional leadership team articulated the problem, what they call the problem of practice this way. 
the, a sense of belonging is vital to any institution, and it's both the core value of our educational community and a foundational condition of learning. That engagement derives from belonging and is central to deep learning. And that problem of practice connects the three of those as instructional goals and not just climate goals. And so we begin in our work in the instructional leadership team and the work in the school improvement plan by acknowledging an absence of belonging and unity among the AHS community members, including students, faculty, and staff. So out of that, a number of initiatives have come up, and I'm going to be very quick about those. Um, and I outline a few of them here. So the first is the heterogeneous grouping um, pilot in English <coughs> 9, which we're doing this year and next year. I have a whole other slideshow about that. So I'm just going to skip these two slides and come back to it. Um, in addition, this year we finally launched what we're calling the equity response team. And that has grown out of work that was initiated by request from our black student union and then worked on in our anti-racism working group and a number of other groups working on diversity equity issues. And that had to do with the issue of microaggressions and bias in the school. Um, and one of the requests of the students was to create an anonymous reporting form that would allow folks to report microaggressions so we could track them, be better at responding to them, and also sharing information. That's been contextualized by this response team, which is led by David Keneally, um, who's one of the teacher leader folks in the Brandeis program this year. Um, he's one of our um, science teachers. And the rest of the equity response team is the administrative team and the advisors who lead each of the um, affinity groups and anti-bias groups, that's the adult members. And uh, we've launched that over a number of steps. So there's a series of advisories, a series of faculty trainings. We'll analyze the uh, results that we've gotten in the middle of the year. Um, and then the group will work together to make presentations that will then report out to the student body, to the staff, and um, I'm assuming we'll probably ask to come and bring that report to you once we've had a chance to work that through. Um, another effort that we're doing around belonging and diversity is the Voices United workshops. A number of years ago, Arlington High School developed these leadership groups around interrupting bias, bullying, harassment and degrading language. We trained about 12 trainers in that and um, a number of those folks are still here. We've trained a few other folks. And what we've done this year is connected one of the advantages of the <coughs> English 9 pilot is that by putting three periods of English in every period, it was much easier to organize a sequence of seven workshop days that allow us to be able to run it. One of the challenges is we've wanted to do it with the whole grade but doing 380 kids at one time requires um, about 17 facilitators and we can't get that many people or that many spaces. So we're doing them two or three workshops at a time. I'm leading those, uh, Margaret Thomas is very involved in that, the administrative team is as well as a number of other staff. We work with the students on um, looking at incidents in our own school, understanding diversity, looking at skills for interrupting bias, um, and then trying to build some more community and sense of belonging and interest in each other and knowledge about each other. Um, so far, the feedback has been relatively positive um, and we're getting better at it every time. The instructional leadership team I talked about a little. I think probably all of the um, principals have talked about it. The instructional leadership team in the high school is interesting because initially we thought we would use the faculty senate because the faculty senate is already a representative group. But the faculty senate um, is really working on different things and we realized that if we wanted to be effective, we needed two groups. So it's actually been nice they're working together as parallel groups. Both groups have representatives from every department in the faculty. Um, the instructional leadership team is focused again on supporting departmental and interdepartmental professional development conversations and initiatives around the problem of practice. Whereas the faculty senate is more of a information conduit that allows us to process operational activities, which still ends up being instructional. We talk about you know, how we're running exams or how the schedules function, but it's not focusing on a particular initiative. That group is starting slow to go fast. So we've got two faculty chairs who are organizing the meetings, um, and we are working slowly on those, but the group is, is moving along very effectively. 
And then we obviously have the building project, which you've all probably heard plenty about, so I won't go into it here, other than to remind everybody that right now we are still engaged, in spite of everything, with a building project in the backyard. We're still at 100% capacity. Um, the administrative team is spending a lot of time getting everything in the current phase one buildings working while planning for programming and projects in the phase two building. Um, some really important things are the faculty are going to be taking time and energy to act clear and organize this year so we can make a quick move in September of the next year. Um, and then there are a number of spaces that will be opening in phase two that are going to require curricular and staffing um, attention. So there are things that we are right now planning for um, and will be part of our budget request in terms of the Smart Lab, which is a student-run printing center and near the library and also a makerspace. Um, the Smart, the Student Cafe and Store, which is in the middle, which is going to be a vocational training program run by our fax department and our special education department. The Immersion Lab, which is um, an elevated view of what world language can use in order to create immersive opportunities and collaborative workspaces. Um, and then there are a number of new special education program spaces that folks are working to think about how their programming will shift in those, as well as obviously the new library and the new cafe. And that's it. How'd I do? You Any really want to know? Yet? 12 minutes, 10 seconds. Oh, I did the 12 minutes. <coughs> Um, any questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Thielman. The only, the only thing I want to note is I think when I was looking at the first slide, um, the school-wide panorama scales percent favorable. It was spring of 22, but the belong, what part of so it was like March, April, was that? When did we do that? I think it was right after the seniors left. Oh, so it was later in the school year. Okay. 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 So we don't, do we have any comparison to like spring of 19 when we're all together for a longer period of time? That's what I was trying to get to. Is there any of that? Do we have that? that did we ever I cannot remember the first year we did the panorama survey, yeah. but I don't think we did it before COVID. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Hellman. Mm -hmm. That's what, what Dr. Jager just said is correct. We didn't start doing this until 2020. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it'd be good to kind of see you know, where we are this year, I think it, it might be better. Well, that is our hope. We're putting a lot of work into it. Yeah, right. I, know, I mean, I know that, but also, yeah, right, for many factors, but yep. one of which is... I mean, one of the hard parts about measuring any of these things, particularly climate and culture, but any of these things, is we change 10 things, Yeah. and then the world keeps moving. And so, you know, we may have a terrible year on belonging in spite of a lot of really great programs, um, and we might have a wonderful year of belonging in spite of a lot of nothing because the weather's better and we're not in a, you know, in a pandemic. So, yeah. absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Cardin. Thanks. Um, so, this, you can probably cover this as part of belonging, but, um, you know, we, we saw last year a lot of social-emotional challenges of kids returning, and I... I, we haven't even had an update on SEL, but I imagine those are continuing. So my question is, you know, how much do the team consider that as a sort of a short-term issue rather than a, than a longer-term SIP issue? And is that sort of wrapped in belonging? Or are you doing other things to address any challenges that you're seeing? So I think belonging as a central focus is sort of a school-wide way of acknowledging this, what one really specific area of concern is around mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, we're doing a lot of things around mental health. I mean, we added, so this year we added a social worker position. We actually created, so our, we've had the Harbor Shortstop, which is our program for students with chronic and complex mental and medical health issues. Um, that has been primarily staffed by paraprofessionals with supervision from our social workers. This year we added a social work position, so there's um, Andrea Razi, who's one of our social workers, has moved into that role where she's supervising that program. Mm -hmm. um, what's nice now is that we have really consistent leadership across all of the general education kind of high-level tier two intervention programs, so Harbor Shortstop, um, Millbrook, and the workplace. And that group of staff has been meeting together this year in terms of planning and thinking about how to better coordinate and collaborate 
those services and programs. So, I mean, that, that's an area where we know there's a lot of need and a lot of support. And we'll, we ran the screener this fall, which last year we didn't run until later in the year. Um, we're looking at other ways of doing mental health screening. You know, so yes, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, Great. But, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Janger, for this. Uh, I was wondering when the next panorama su surveys and their results are going to be. Uh, we conducted the panorama survey for students today. <laughs> Dr. Hellman, do you want to add it? And then in the spring, we will, uh, and we will do it again in the classrooms um, as part of the English 9 pilot, um, as well as with staff and students. Some of the some of the outcomes I tied to fall um, to fall twenty three administration, particularly the building ones, because I felt like that was going to be helpful in terms of how well we do, and I'm hoping we do it shortly after we've completed the move. Dr. Holman, did you want to add anything? Um, I'll just add that, and I'll mention this in my superintendent's update too, that we're doing um, panorama surveys for the entire community during the month of November. Uh, the high school was first out the gate today um, with students, and that will close prior to the Thanksgiving holiday. So we'll be advertising that soon. And we should have data back at some point in December. Anything else, Dr. Allison Ampey? No, thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Janger. And now we will have the Arlington High School Heterogeneous Grouping Initiative update. Thank you so much. So I have with me um, two of the English 9 teachers. Um, Megan Miller was up there somewhere and Nicole Edson. Um, so I'm going to start the presentation and then um, they're going to pivot to what the teachers have been doing. And I'll try to be short-winded in my section. So the things we're going to just talk about today, um, I'm going to review some resources that you can look at and you may have questions about that go a lot more into depth with what's going on. Um, then uh, I'll talk a little bit about the work that the staff did going into this. Again, they'll outline more of the content of that. Um, and then we're going to look a little bit at some of the information we've gotten in terms of outcome and participation. Um, Ms. Morgan had asked whether we were going to put a breakdown by race. So there's a slide that I added in here um, just now because we finished that. So I'll talk a little bit about what we've seen so far in terms of the breakdown and participation. And then the teachers will talk a little more. So uh, going to the next slide, um, if you look at those three slides, so you're all familiar with the second two. One is the proposal that outlines why we're doing this and the rationale and process that brought us here. The second is the website that has a lot of resources. The ninth grade English teachers developed with me over the summer the FAQ, which was shared with parents, which answers a lot of the questions about the nuts and bolts of how honors is going to work, some of the key questions that folks had about things like what is the difference between honors, how do you check, how, how does the grading work, how does it work if you transition, what happens if you switch halfway through the year. There's a lot of logistical, technical decisions and questions that folks had about that. So all of that is outlined there. And if you want to come back to any of that as a question, I'm happy to do that. So following the decision to move to heterogeneous ninth grade English, um, the ninth grade English teachers met first in the spring to plan for the planning. What did they need? What programming do they want? Ms. Edson stepped up to be a kind of a teacher lead on that. So she's um, taking a role of, in addition, making sure to help run those meetings, organize information, um, and um, facilitate the cooperative planning so that the teachers are able to use that time really productively. Um, all of the teachers, I will say, though, have really stepped up in terms of taking a really serious role in this. So the first thing we did in order to ground our conversation was a, a workshop with a consultant named Kim Marshall. He's the fellow who writes the Marshall Memo, which many administrators, I think every administrator I know subscribes to. Um, and what he was looking at 
was sort of what are, what are models of effective planning for differentiated learning? How does universal design work? How do you really make that effective um, in what is really held out by the research? And that grounded a lot of our conversation. And then we spent the next three days examining ninth grade texts, as it says, looking at essential questions. The staff decided that they would be looking at three texts and units that they would do at the same time. So there's some flexibility in terms of um, what people were doing when and the flow. Um, sometimes that's helpful just in terms of not doing all the same things at the same time. But in order to sometimes be having common conversations about common texts and common pieces of work, they're aligning three units during the course of the year. Then being English teachers, we started really getting into the nitty gritty of narrative text, expository writing, how the rubrics work, and then how they were gonna use common planning time, what resources they were gonna bring in for that, um, and then reading a number of other texts about equity and teaching and grading. So was, honestly, I will say as a person who doesn't always, the two things are most fun for me are when I get to work with kids and when I actually get to talk teaching with teachers. So I don't know how the, they enjoyed it, but it was a highlight of my year. So um, again, you can look, this is uh, where we are starting in terms of baseline in the program. Last spring we conducted the panorama survey in classrooms um, to look at kind of what the baseline was. The English department does really very, very well in that classroom in terms of students reporting on climate, you know, they have, Kids really reported a positive climate in those classes. They required high le levels of pedagogical effectiveness, high levels of rigorous expectations, pretty good relations with the teachers. Um, but again, we see us lowest in issues of belonging and engagement. So that's one of the areas in which we're looking to see improvement. Um, if, however, they all remain only the same, then there's not, in, in many ways, we see the default as being inclusion. And since the default is inclusion, if all of those things are only the same, if students are engaged and learning and no more bored and just as belonging as they were, then we should keep them all together in a class because of all the other benefits of inclusion. We, however, expect and hope for significant improvements in all those things. Um, so you've already seen this slide about belonging in high schools, um, which is interestingly, if you compare our results while they're low, 52% or 54%, if you compare it to other high schools, that actually puts that at the 90th percentile. Um, so the most interesting thing, of course, is after we've gone through the process of bringing the students in, we gave them three weeks to make the decision about honors, we explained to them how those different things worked, we tiered the assignments so students understand the differences in expectations, we made the expectations be around more better work and deeper work rather than just more work, which is, I think, one of the concerns we have. The question is to be more sophisticated. Ms. Miller will explain that. She does it better than I do. So I'll leave that for her. So what did we see? What we see is that when we look across the last five years, the two years in which we've been heterogeneously grouped, which are 2000, or the 21 school year and this school year, Participation in honors has been over 60%. This year it's even higher at 65%. And over the three years um, in the last five, five, in this previous five years, when we were not heterogeneous group, as you can see, participation in honors in English 9 um, ranged between 55 and 48%. So we are excited that right out of the gate we're seeing a higher level of participation. Um, and so this is the new slide. Do you have that, Dr. Hellman? Um, so then the question was um, participation by race. So if you look, um, currently what we're seeing is that at, um, participation by race still shows a gap. And I'm going to have to go deeper into the data in terms of breaking it down to have a consistent look across English 9 across the last four years where we're counting race the same way. Um, but this looks right now like we are closing gaps pretty significantly. Um, if you look at the next slide, the trends across in participation across ninth and 10th grade, so this is not just for English 9, that African American students were half as likely to participate in honors. So the gap was almost 
um, and the gap for Hispanic students was about 20 percent. And then if you go back up to this slide, you'll see that the gap has closed um, somewhat. Um, and the proportion for African American students has gone up. But there is still a substantial gap there, um, and that is something we are going to interrogate. I mean, the reality is that the number of students we're talking about in these columns, there are 19 students in the column marked black and 30 students in the column marked Hispanic. So we plan to actually speak to the students because there's not that many of them. And so we can really have conversations about why they're making those choices. Is it that they didn't feel invited? That they didn't feel it was for them? Is it their concerns about preparation um, or, or the messages those students have been given? So we really want to have that conversation with them to make sure that we are optimizing students' chances to be at the right level. So now I'm going to hand the, I guess, the microphone over to uh, Ms. Edson and Ms. Miller. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Jinger. Um, so as you can see on the slide, I would like to start off by explaining how we as the English 9 team began the year with our students, um, including sort of what unit we started with. Uh, over the summer, we had a conversation about which points in the year we thought we could align our units. And the beginning of the year was a great opportunity to do that. So all of the English 9 teachers began with the same sort of set of skills and we all started with a short story unit in particular, the theme of the unit is identity and belonging. That's something that we've been developing as a thematic unit for the past few years. So the texts that we use are a mix of short stories, um, short films, nonfiction, podcasts, poetry, things like that. So the selection of texts vary somewhat across teachers, but we use essential questions like, um, who am I? How do I create and define my identity? Um, how do I define home and belonging? And how does understanding literature help me to better understand myself and others? Um, so that's sort of the unifying theme that the teachers use to access uh, a wide variety of texts for the students. And then uh, Nicole is going to talk a little bit about how the discourse in the classes themselves have been going since this change um, across you know, this first unit and now that we're all getting into a second unit as the year goes on. Thanks, Megan. Um, so we've noticed now, when I'm speaking, I'm speaking for um, all of the ninth grade teachers. So I'll say these are teachers, but this is all what was, has been reported to me um, and what I've experienced as well. Uh, so, so far the discourse during this unit has been engaging and interesting. Um, students at both levels are beginning to feel comfortable expressing their ideas in the whole class setting. Um, we've done some informal feedback surveys from the students, just kind of giving them a Google Classroom check-in, how's it going? And many, many of the students have reported that they enjoy the classroom discussions. Um, the collaboration between students has been successful with meaningful conversation and questioning, both in partner work and small groups. Overall, teachers have reported that classes are running smoothly. Um, many teachers have mentioned that students have asked if they could do the honors level work for certain assignments to try it out, um, even if they had already signed up for A-level work. Um, it's something that we've talked about in our, just recently started to talk about in our common planning groups about how this works and um, what that means for the mid-year in terms of being able to sign up for um, or change levels. Um, again, from some of those surveys that we gave to the students, um, they've reported in them that the, and this is from quoting, the work is challenging but manageable and they're enjoying class so far. Um, preparing for this change, I will say, like required a lot of real work to be done over the summer. So we had those five days. I don't want to be redundant about um, what Dr. Jenger said, but um, I, I will say it was it was it was a lot of work. I mean, it was a lot of work to prepare. It wasn't something that we took lightly, and it wasn't something. Um, even though we've all taught heterogeneous classes at the twelfth grade level, it was definitely something that we had to dig into to make sure. Um, we could align the skills. I mean, one of the things we did was also think about uh, what skills we teach and how they, are they the same at each level? Are they different? What are we looking for across the levels and how is that going to look within one classroom? Um, in terms of, I think 
another thing that teachers reported is that the test, the technical aspect in power school continues to be pretty time consuming um, when dealing with heterogeneous classes. And while administration has provided licenses for the Google Classroom Transfer Program, which many teachers are now using, uh, more technical support for power school is definitely needed um, because that those times and minutes add up. Am I missing anything, Megan, there? No, I don't think so. I can touch on the common planning time. Um, so the teachers on the ninth grade team um, have a designated common planning time that we've been using for the beginning of the year so far to do a variety of things. Uh, that time is really helpful for us to check in with our team members. Um, we plan on using an upcoming common planning block to uh, work on a calibration of our grading of an assessment of student writing. So we've worked so far on several other aspects of, you know, teaching the heterogeneous courses, but we've been gathering samples of student writing and in an upcoming common planning block, we're going to be, you know, anonymously um, scoring and comparing notes on what our expectations are, how those expectations um, compare, you know, across teachers and across levels. Uh, so we have a common assessment prompt that we'll do, uh, that we'll use for the student samples of that. So we are going to be talking about what we noticed about the writing in terms of strengths, areas for growth, uh, for growth and what we want to address um, and how we want to address those areas going forward. Um, Nicole, was there anything else that we wanted to touch on? Nope. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's hear it. Okay. So, <clears throat> comments or questions from the committee? Mr. Slickman. A uh, few basic questions. Uh, one of the things that we did was we were concerned about class size. Do we have a sense of what the class sizes are right now? So we ended up with, I believe, 21 sections. Mm -hmm. There were a few more, um, and we decided we didn't want to end up in a hole. Mm -hmm. So I believe that the class, so the class sizes are capped at 22. Mm -hmm. Sections run from uh, about, actually I should look, but seven, I think it's 18 to 22 in the regular classes. There are uh, some co-tots that are running like 13 and 14, so actually some smaller classes. And that has made it more manageable, I would take it. I mean, we work hard across the school to have small class sizes in those, those mm -hmm. ninth grade classes and mm -hmm. introductory classes. But absolutely, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, the class, the teachers general are running an, you know, an average class size of 18, 19 kids. So it mm -hmm. makes a big difference. And so my sense is that we're sort of using this, uh, uh, the English classes is also a way way to welcome and generate the belonging that was the other issue, right? That, that's what I'm hearing. I mean, we are hoping that we are generating that belonging in all of the kids' mm -hmm. classes, but the focus obviously in ninth grade English and that heterogeneous experience, mm -hmm. right? I mean, part of the, the pilot's idea was that our goal is to think about the experience of ninth grade. Do we have any anecdotal evidence that kids who would not have even considered honors uh, moved up? I will defer to the folks who've had those one-to-one -one conversations. Um, I'm happy to speak to that. I've had conversations with several students. I, I teach two sections of the ninth grade uh, English this year, and I've had conversations with several students in, across those two classes about whether or not they should take honors, and all of those students that I spoke to ended up signing up for honors. So, you know, I counseled them in terms of what the difference was, but um, didn't push them either way. I told them, you know, they should talk to their parents and think about what they are um, interested in signing up for, and they all ended up signing up for honors, which I think might speak to that. I mean, the numbers are increasing. I mean, the numbers would indicate that that's the case, right? We're, we're about 15% higher mm -hmm. than the general number of students taking honors. So that's, you know, 45 kids or more than 50 kids that wouldn't have been in honors in any <clears throat> other year that are in honors now. And what we expect, because what we know is that the strongest predictor of being in honors classes in the future is being honors classes now. Mm -hmm. um, so the expectation is 
you know, it's like getting, it's like with, when you're entering salary is $2,000 higher, it's not just $2,000, it's $2,000 every year for the rest of your life, and all of your raises are based on that. Mm -hmm. So uh, the fact that we now have students hopefully successfully engaging in honors level curriculum, most likely our expectation is they'll continue in, in English, mm -hmm. and they will be much more likely to spread out into other classes, which is one of the things we'll be looking at next fall. I think the message, is, the message is important that we're telling them, yes, we believe you can do this, and if they're hearing the message and actually going out and doing this and succeeding, uh, it, it's going to be a win-win for everybody. I mean, one of the really anecdotal things that, that Ms. Edson's talked about is the fact that kids are sitting in a class where they're not doing honors, mm -hmm. and that in every class there are kids saying, can I try the honors work, mm -hmm. right, that they're, they're there seeing honors level work being done, mm -hmm. feeling like they can try it. So one of the first indicators we're going to get is whether in January, which way the motion is. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm expecting that we will go up from 65% when kids are like, well, why am I not doing that too? It'll be interesting to see how grades are as well too, assuming that our grading is consistent over, uh, over the standards that we held before. My last question is, Obviously, these are ninth graders coming in from the Odyssey. Are, are we thinking or doing anything with the Odyssey folks to help facilitate this for next year? I mean, we are not working with the Odyssey teachers. We will mm -hmm. be having conversations as we get into course selection, mm -hmm. um, where we, again, are working on communicating to the teachers what those expectations are so they can be clear. Um, and talking to people in course selection. However, mm -hmm. one of the nice things about heterogeneous grouping is you don't have to choose. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, there has been some discussion already around how we can, whether or not we wanted to, to shift to make the, the process of the shift easier. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the things that the teachers were talking about is that the running two grade books Mm -hmm. having to run mm -hmm. for three weeks mm -hmm. without them, mm -hmm. switching them is technically kind of difficult. We bought, yeah. Yeah. We bought grade transferer as an application for folks mm -hmm. to transfer grades from Google Classroom if they do grading that way. Mm -hmm. um, but technical support about that is also something we're going to be looking at. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, th the thing is, is that instructionally, the most difficult transition in terms of academic achievement uh, and uh, all, all this social emotional stuff we're talking about in terms of belonging is that it, uh, that transition from middle school to high school is very difficult and anything we can do to ease that uh, I, I see is really a critical aspect of making the heterogeneous grouping uh, work because we're advancing the break point between the honors and the non honors and building a little more of a together building. Thanks. I, I'm, I, I look forward to hearing more positive news from the program. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. So um, one of the teachers, I'm not sure which one, you just said you, you had um, conversation with some of your students when they were choosing. And the, you know, the FAQs on, on making the choice are very vague. So I wonder if you could elaborate in you know, just a couple minutes. What, what, what you say in those conversations about what the difference is between honors and, and not honors? Sure, yeah, I can elaborate a little bit on that. Um, in the FAQ document, we talk about some key uh, sort of qualities that distinguish honors level work from A-level work or the standards that we hold all students to versus the sort of um, more sophisticated standards that we would hold honor students to on um, particular assignments. So uh, sophistication, consistency, and independence are some of those qualities that we ask honor students to demonstrate, especially by the end of the year. And so one of the things that I mentioned to the students who are on the fence about which way they should go, um, I mentioned that the curriculum itself is the same um, between the two levels. We're all in the same class together. We're one class community. We're all having discussions about the same text, 
But when, you know, we ask, um, for example, a writing prompt, there would be uh, the sort of standard level writing prompt, and then the honor students would have a writing prompt that asks them something more complex and more sophisticated. And then their product that they produce for us, that writing, would need to be more complex and more sophisticated um, in order to achieve, like, you know, say an A on that assignment. So it's really, you know, the the homework every night is the same. There's not additional assignments. It's the level of complexity that we're asking of honor students and that we're asking for them, you know, in return. To add to that also, um, we as a department or as a ninth grade team rather created um, the ninth grade ELA skills chart. Um, I don't know if that's linked anywhere on the slides. I'm happy to, to add it, but essentially it shows um, a chart where can I share my screen or do I not have that access? Yeah, you can share it. It's, it's linked it's like on can. the FAQ, but I think you got Okay, there. it's linked on the FAQ. Okay, so but, yeah, but so it's also on the problem they get a PDF, so the link may not work in there. So <clears> let's if see you if I can share that. Yeah, um, so essentially we have here um, where we came up with all students will be expected to, and then here are the standards for writing, reading, and discourse. And then next to that are the um, students electing honors level work will also be ex expected to. And so we take students through the differences there. Um, and like Megan said, when it comes to sophistication and consistency and independence, and we also provide student samples. So that's one of the ways that we teach writing or we teach reading or ways in which that we see um, where, what is it, what it, you know, it's, what does it mean to be more sophisticated? What does it mean to have a more sophisticated claim or to be able to find different and more sophisticated evidence? Um, so students and parents have seen this as well. And I just wanna say, I mean, your, your point actually speaks to one of the real advantages around heterogeneous grouping, which is that as an English teacher to say what a more sophisticated argument looks like or to describe what a more sophisticated argument looks like is a rabbit hole, right? You can write this and so you can say, use transitional words, invest the in, you know, implications, independent. So you can talk about this again, but nobody knows what that looks like if they don't see somebody do it. And so one of the huge advantages of heterogeneous grouping is that they're in a context where people are doing and practicing work at the level that they're being asked to do it. And so it happens in context. And actually, I think one of the nice things um, about the current model, which we don't do in our most of our other heterogeneous classes, is students may guess wrong, right? They may be like, oh, I can do that. They have an opportunity then to try it during the course of the year, because they're watching someone do it. They can try it, and then they can switch at the semester mark if they want to step up and do that. So I think that's. The fact that there, the fact that it's very difficult to describe what higher level work looks like without being in a context where people are participating in it. Great, thank you. And then just the other suggestion is that when we, when CIA looks at HGI, I think at our next meeting, right? December. In December, um, it would be useful. You know, now that we actually are running and have assignments that have been given out, it would be useful to see what those differential assignments look like, particularly for the ones that have been you know developed across all classes. Thank you. We have some samples of those too. We need it. Great. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Um, so I was going to ask for the exemplars in December as well. Um, I was also uh, in December and I can put this in an email. I was, I had asked uh, you and I, it was, you know, within 24 hours of this meeting. So um, around uh, race data, which I appreciate is like we definitely need to make sure we're counting the same groups of kids, right? So the three focal groups that were called out in the pilot were students of color, which you can figure out which how you're going to define that, right? Um, ELL students and students with IEPs. So those would be the three that I would be interested in that that was what the pilot was based on. So participation rates for those three, um, three groups um, would be uh, helpful, I think. You know, the, the two pieces with this that are tough, um, and you alluded to one of them already, 
is, is it's going to be, with these really small sample sizes, statistical significance is going to be hard to show, right? Because they're really small groups, and, and you can see when you have small groups of students, you know, just sort of, ran, if you randomize it, you they can move around quite a bit. So I, I think that the conversations are really going to be really important because, um, you know, it, it may be hard, you know, even if you're seeing growth in participation with such small numbers as we have, it may be hard to show that they're statistically different. So um, I really, I hope that you have those conversations. I'm interested in hearing obviously anonymized um, and sort of the take homes from that. Um, to the same end, the, the challenge, and, and we went around and around about this in the spring and there was just no good solution for it, but you know, there's a lot of emphasis on the, the survey data, which I think is, is fine. Um, the pro one of the problems is, is that the, the, the data you're gonna compare it to, right? You're gonna compare to spring 2022. You have different kids now, right? Like those, those ninth graders from the spring of 22 are now 10th graders and you're gonna compare their panorama survey data to kids who were eighth graders last year, right? Obviously. So I think that, um, and, you know, and we had talked, I know, about saying, well, do we go back to those kids in eighth grade and give this survey data to that, like to, you know, to try and come, but they were in a heterogeneous class then. So I don't know that it's going to be tough, um, but it'll be interesting to see at, at, you know, maybe, maybe at the classroom level, you'll be able to see more. Um, and the other piece, because we're talking about this um, and because it's the end of October and these conversations are already starting at the Audison. I'm not going to recommend you for honors unless you dot, 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 right? Mm -hmm. That's already happening in October. Um, I, I really hope that, um, that there is some connection with eighth grade teachers and I, I don't know whatever you guys need to do to, to, to support, um, the course recommendation process for next year. Um, I think any resources that can be allocated to that should be because, um, you know, I think the messaging is already sort of starting. Um, and so I think the, the, you know, the more that can be done to align however that happens with, you know, what you want to see when they're here, I think is, is worth doing and soon. I mean, one thing we have considered is actually largely eliminating the course recommendation um, because what we see is that students and parents can answer the question for themselves, mm -hmm. which is if you are taking English and getting an A and not struggling with the homework, then honors is probably fine. If you're taking English and you're getting a B and you're not struggling with the homework, you can probably go on and do honors if you're under, okay with getting a B. Um, and if you are, you know, so I mean, in many ways, the sort of judgment conversation about who should, mm -hmm. I think in many ways is one that we probably should move away from across the board because you don't need to, right? A kid can make that decision based on their grade. And, and to be honest, if you're getting a C and you really, really, really want to try, you might want to, you know, and, and of course for English, you won't have to have this conversation. That's a conversation that's much more about your math classes and your um, and your science classes. Yeah, I just I I, my, I just encourage you to engage. I mean, maybe the Audison teachers will be like, "Super, I'm psyched. I don't have to do this. Like, I, I'd love to get out of this business altogether, yeah. and I'm willing to have conversations with the 10 percent of students who need to have them with me or with their families. So they may be perfectly happy to get out of this business altogether and I, you know if that's the case I think that that's a good thing I think one thing that would be helpful um, would be to share with families at some point what the participation rates are by discipline um, they must be higher because when you told us in the mm -hmm. spring we were we were using the number of two-thirds of students are participating in honors classes which is across the board, but then it, it was kind of weird because it was like two thirds are mostly participating. So I don't know, clearly the number was lower in English. Maybe it's higher. I mean, it must be higher, must be higher than 66% in other ones if that's where it averages out. But I think sharing with families and students where those participation rates are, because I think, you know, like 
for those of us who are parents now, like when, when I was in school, it was like 15% of kids were in honors, right? And, and that's not the case now. And maybe that also would be helpful for people mm -hmm. to be like, oh gosh, you know, if there's, you know, if 60% of the kids are doing this, then like I can do that too. So that, that might be helpful. Um, just, you know, to encourage, um, to encourage people to engage in it, especially in the, in the disciplines that aren't going to be um, heterogeneous. So um, thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask something. I'm, it's, I'm hoping it won't come off sounding bad. I'm, I am happy that we are doing this pilot and stuff, but I'm also thinking about the people who are not happy about the idea. So I'm wondering with the writing prompt, when you're for the honors students, when you're asking them something that's more complex, more sophisticated, how is that, how do they learn? You know, how is that broken down for them? Or do they just have to go home and stare at, stare at it themselves at home? Um, and then the same for their product. How do they, I, I understand that you're looking, you, you read their work and presumably you give them comments and, and they hear what you're saying for their work, but what about their friend's work? Or you know, is there classroom discussions about um, how this met the standard or how this didn't? Um, you know, where you're sharing one student's work with all the students. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to understand how you aren't sort of, I mean, how, how we aren't effectively asking the kids just to figure things out on their own. And I'm not saying that you do, it's just I haven't heard yet how, how we're not. So that's all. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, we are, I think that this is the same um, way we've gone about our work in English classes before in that we take, like you said, we will take a student sample. Of course, we always ask the student beforehand if we can share their work anonymously or if they want their name on it. And we, we go through the work, right? So once they've handed something in, we put it up, we give copies to all the students and we say, okay, let's move through this. So what was, let's take a look at this claim. What do you notice about this claim? What does this writer do later on so that they use evidence to support that claim? What do you notice about the evidence? Okay, well here in this paper, sometimes I'll just, you know, well, we could have used this piece of evidence, but instead this writer chose to um, choose the piece of evidence that best shows something about the character or that more shows something about that character that they were trying to prove, let's just say if that was the prompt. So we move through um, writing as a whole class Absolutely, having those discussions um, about the work and moving through it together. And then also um, some of that, some of the, a lot of the differentiation also happens. And I think maybe, I, I don't know if this is something that you were asking, but um, we work with kids, like no student would ever be expected to figure something out completely on their own, regardless of what level they were taking the course. So we move through the prompt, we go through the prompt, whether it's an honors level prompt, an A-level prompt, we break down the prompt together. And a lot of the writing process actually happens in class um, where we are sitting with students individually and having writing conferences individually with all students um, on their drafts, their brainstorming um, and the revision process. And just to add on to what Nicole said, we use um, strategies like graphic organizers and scaffolding for all students. Um, you know, I teach um, a COTOT, I teach two sections of the COTOT ninth grade. So I have um, students on IEPs who require um, a special educator in the room as well. And so it really is a range of student ability levels and readiness levels, but all students have access to lots and lots of scaffolding. And then we do look, like Nicole said, at examples and the sort of like wonderful thing about English is that, um, and I talk about this with my like AP seniors as well, they're sort of like, here is a perfectly correct way of writing this paragraph. And then here's the paragraph that does it 
you know, just with that little bit extra sophistication. And so we kind of look at those differences and it's not to say that that more basic one or, you know, uh, less sophisticated or complex answer is wrong in any way. It's meeting standards. Um, and then there's sort of the exceeding standards. And so we try to look at those um, examples and have conversations uh, to help the kids and guide them towards that. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I think that's something I don't know how we can capture that, but it's useful for those parents who were really concerned that their kids were just gonna be off in the corner doing something different. So thank you. And, and one of the things to realize is that that question, what is the difference between higher level work and lower level work is a huge portion of what English class is about. Right, going through developing in kids, how do you figure that out, um, is what English classes are about. And having a diversity of students and a diversity of experiences actually helps students to learn that. Um, <clears throat> so I have two sort of unrelated questions. I First, I just wanna say thank you to the teachers for being here and sharing your experiences. It's really helpful to hear what it looks like um, in the classroom. Um, and I also appreciated your honesty about how much work it took to, um, to bring this together over the summer. Um, so with that, I want, I'm curious what kinds of things, time, resources, do you feel like you would need to sort of continue? Like, do you feel like the common planning time that you have right now is enough? Do you wish that there were more? Um, do you wish, and maybe this is already happening, but like um, Dr. McNeil's professional development opportunities are there, is, um, that is across the district, are there opportunities there for you to work together? So what, what more would you wish you had to, to keep this um, or to have this be even more successful? Sorry, you're on my Zoom there too, which is why I'm kind of like. Um, I, can, I can start, Nicole, if, if that's okay. Um, and I'll, I'll speak for myself, but also for my half of the common planning team, um, because we've had this conversation just about, um, you know, what we need or if we need anything. I think that one of the things that comes up in our conversations a lot is that the teaching side of it um, feels really good and it doesn't feel necessarily that different than what we've always done, right? We feel very sort of prepared and supported in the actual teaching of the kids. Um, and then it's sort of when we get down to the nitty gritty of the technical side of things, that's where we feel like we just need a little bit of help or it, it's um, taking up a lot of time and, and energy, um, having the divided power school, for example, having the process of having kids sign up three weeks into school, just some of the logistics um, have, been difficult for us, but the actual support of having our colleagues, having the common planning time, the professional development that we've had, I, I feel very good about what we've been able to do so far. Thank you. I agree with you, Megan. Thank you. Um, and then my other question is broader and um, has sort of stemmed from what Ms. Morgan was, was thinking about. So we have these ninth graders that are in this this heterogeneous English, and because this is a two-year pilot, they're going to go to 10th grade and then get to choose honors or curriculum. Is that, and that's accurate? If we don't make 10th grade right. it's a two. It's, it's the plan yes. right now is it's a two-year pilot for ninth grade. So I'm just, I'm, so I, is there a plan, or I would suggest, and I'm not a researcher, or, but to document or, what what the students do in ninth, what the, the current ninth graders choose in 10th grade, and do we see, you know, more it, of them going into It is our plan honors. to track whether or not students sustain participation rates at the upper grades, and it's also our plan to look at whether we see, I mean, my hope would be A, that they sustain it in English, but that B, since we have students who you know, arguably 15%, a group of 50 students who might not have taken honors and they're taking it, let's just say, that hopefully they also, we see increased levels in other classes as students branch out into other honors classes. So we will 
we will monitor that. And I'd also be interested to see what 10th graders who don't choose honors English, so they stay in choose curriculum A for 10th grade, does their work look different because they were in this heterogeneous class than previous 10th graders, I guess. Is. Anyway, just things to, to continue to think about as you, as you move through this. Um, thank you. Does anybody else want to add? Mr. Slickman. I, I, I picked up on something that Ms. Morgan said, which worries me, uh, talking about teachers uh, withholding recommendations for honors level courses. We made a decision in 2004, and obviously there are only two of us on the committee now who were on the board at that time, and the opinion of this committee may not align 100% to what we decided back then. But at the time, we had a 20% reduction in state aid. We lost an override, and we had to do a bunch of things to reduce costs, and one of them was reducing the number of tracks or levels within the school from three to two. So we had an intermediate advanced level between college and honors, and we pulled that out. And the honors had very strict boundaries, including previous grades and teacher recommendations. And in removing that middle ground, we didn't want everybody to drop, drop down. We wanted to give as much access to kids as possible with the philosophy that every kid is entitled to try, every kid is entitled to succeed, and if they choose to attempt it and don't succeed, that is their right to do that, and we will support them and make adjustments for them in that situation. So the philosophy that we set forth back when we reduced the tracks, and I think it's very clear within the course handbook right now that all these, uh, the, these restrictive prerequisites to get to the good stuff were removed. And if I'm hearing that somewhere in the system we are doing teacher recommendations as a prerequisite for placement in honors classes, it is against my philosophy of education. It is against the decision we made in 2004 and I would invite the committee to re-examine that to state it very clearly that, that it's, uh, and I hope my colleagues would agree that this is inconsistent with the way we want to see the system run. So let me be clear. Mm -hmm. Arlington High School has, for at least the last 10 years, mm -hmm. always been challenged by choice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The only prerequisites we have are you have to take algebra one before you take algebra two. Yes. Right. French one before French two. Right. That was that, that was what we and set forth. One thing that's challenging in some of these conversations mm -hmm. is interpretations of the culture of school, particularly by people who aren't even in the school, mm -hmm. um, and how that then works its way through the community zeitgeist mm -hmm. are not always within our control. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy because I've been in this meeting where people have asserted things I have said. Mm -hmm. And I have gone through because, in fact, we recorded the last two years of the presentations that I've made mm -hmm. to the staff and the students about what the recommendations are and posted those to the classes. Mm -hmm. um, we have always been clear, right, mm -hmm. that students be, should be choosing right, the mm -hmm. classes that they think are appropriate. The purpose of teacher recommendations is to help provide kids with guidance mm -hmm. in making those choices, but they're not required to do that. Part of why what I was saying was that I feel like we could do away with recommendations is that I still think that the mindset that comes with that is that it is, un is unnecessary because in fact, the families and children already have mm -hmm. the information, mm -hmm. which is you're, you know what grades you're getting in those classes, mm -hmm. and you know how much you're, the, the main thing I've ever said to people is, is everyone recommends honors, and you're 
struggling to do the work, you might want to think about not taking one of those classes as honors. Mm -hmm. And if you feel like you're doing fine with the level of work and you want to step up to a challenge, mm -hmm. you may want to choose to take an honors class. Mm -hmm. But in general, because people know what grade they're getting and they know how much they are struggling to keep up with homework, which really are the two big concerns, mm -hmm. um, they probably can predict that without our having to go through the process in the first This time. is the message that I've heard from you and the high school staff for a long time. So it was my assumption that this was pervasive in the district. If it is inconsistent anywhere in the district, I, I think that we need to make a clear statement. And, and but let me just say, mm -hmm. as, as I often have mm -hmm. A kid who tells a parent who tells me, mm -hmm. and a teacher who tells a parent mm -hmm. who tells me, mm -hmm. and then I bring the people into the same room. Mm -hmm. A conversation that I can 100% imagine a middle school teacher having reasonably with a middle school child is that if you're going to do this, or if this is the level of work mm -hmm. I'm seeing, I would not recommend mm -hmm. you do honors next year. I can 100% see a nervous, anxious eighth grader mm -hmm. saying, they're not going to let me take honors. Mm -hmm. When a teacher is saying to the kid, I don't think honors will be a good idea. Right? So I think that messaging is important. I think some of the recommendations uh, Ms. Morgan made about how we could review that messaging with the mm -hmm. students is important. I think it's a conversation we'll have with Brian and I think convey back to the eighth grade teachers. Um, but I think it's a both Do and. I think both of those Doc things. Dr. Important. Homan wants to say something too. Go ahead, Dr. Hohen. I just want to uh, sort of note that this particular challenge is certainly one that's a district level challenge. And so something that I'll work with Dr. Jenger and, and Mr. Maringer to think through what this looks like for next year um, and sort of state along with everyone that the last thing we want to be doing is discouraging any student who wants a challenge to take a challenge. Mm -hmm. And that I would agree with Dr. Jenger very much that students and, and families have the information that they need based on their experience to make that decision. And that we may really wanna take a look at eliminating the recommendations, not without the opportunity for families to come back to us and ask us for a conversation, come, go back to their eighth grade teacher and ask for a conversation, or even go have a conversation with a ninth grade teacher who might know a little bit more about what that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so, but this is certainly a district level challenge that I think we need to tackle and I hear the feedback and we will make sure that we do that. And I will also wanted the opportunity to say a very big thank you to Dr. Jenger um, for the two presentations tonight and especially mm -hmm. to our teachers um, for joining us. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. So, and the other thing I think that, that along with the recommendation piece, every year my experience has been that power school always says you need a teacher recommendation to register for this class so when you do that it's not true i get that it's not true i get that it's against our policy but it it happens every time in power school something will be weird and it'll be like well mm -hmm. and, and it'll still let you pick it it'll still let you choose it but it tells you that right and that's not great it says mm -hmm. on the the mm -hmm. I know my daughter's geometry class said you can't register for geometry honors without a teacher recommendation. Like the note was next to the class for like the whole year. So I hope that that's something that can get, maybe if the recommendation piece goes away, maybe that'll all disappear in power school. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think there's any intent to make it like that in power school. I I, it's just that the impact mm -hmm. is that people get to that point and they're like, oh, wait, so I do need a teacher recommendation. So maybe I shouldn't sign up. So. Um, mm -hmm. I hope that that's that has that's been a ghost key. in the machine that you have pointed out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it keeps happening, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, moving on, diversity and hiring report, Mr. Spiegel. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we've uh, prepared uh, one report, uh, sort of in two parts. Um, Kelly Piggott is here, who's the assistant director of HR. I want to thank Kelly and our team for. Kelly did a lot of the work to put this uh, report together, and um, I'm going to get started. So I'm going to go over an overview of our new hires this year, an overview of some of the exits we've had and reasons for staff departures, an overview of our um, onboarding and mentoring and new teacher orientation, uh, high-level overview of current vacancies, 
and then we'll get to demographic data and our next steps for recruitment and retention and then have time for questions. Um, so as you know, uh, you met the new administrators a few mm -hmm. weeks ago with a, a new director of social studies, visual arts, performing arts, wellness, um, special ed coordinator at the high school, new assistant principals at Audison, Stratton, and uh, two new, uh, new assistant principals at Brackett. Um, our new AEA Unit A educators, we have quite a few. We have about 82 new educators who began on or after um, August of this year. Um, um, you know, we've had re some replacing educators who retired, who resigned, who moved to other positions within the district, who are in leaves of absence, new to the budget, and um, then we also have educators who um, started last year who are continuing um, this year, started after I gave this presentation last year, in the middle of the year last year, we added some people. Um, you can see the new hires by school, the high school had quite a few new mm -hmm. teachers this year, um, as did Audison, and, and you can see the numbers for the other schools. Um, you know, we have a very highly educated staff. Um, both our teaching staff and many of our paraprofessionals as well have master's degrees. Um, and we've continued the tradition where we have people who have been teaching assistants in the district, have been long-term substitutes or done their student teaching here, who are now teachers within the district. Um, our AEA Unit D and AEA Unit C hires, AEA Unit D again is our paraprofessionals, teaching assistants, uh, specialized support paraprofessionals, library paraprofessionals, and tutors. Um, we have 54, maybe a couple more <laughs> in the past couple days. We keep adding people. We are still looking for some paraprofessionals, teaching assistants throughout the district. Um, we have one new administrative assistant at the Audison this year. We are actually, we have a couple administrative assistant vacancies. Um, at Audison and Gibbs that we are um, in the different stages of hiring processes on. Um, and then other new employees, you know, we have a very robust after school program. The after school program tends to have some churn um, because of the nature of the position. They are, um, you know, people who are looking um, either to go into teaching in other areas or um, you know, doing this job, um, you know, for a few years. And so we do have a, quite a few uh, new teachers in that program. We have uh, some vacancies still in that program. Um, food service, building custodians, traffic supervisors, bus drivers. Uh, and this is since last year. Uh, you know, we had a change in our registration uh, team at the sometime like in the middle in the fall, winter of last year. And then a lot of other employees. We hire a lot of people in the summer for summer school, uh, our various summer school programs, um, community ed, athletics, daycare, um, and daily subs. I, I will highlight, we still have, I, I will get to this with vacancies. There are a couple areas in here where we are in need. If people are looking for positions in, um, at, you know, any of the positions that, you know, are listed here, including food service, crossing guards, um, uh, and paraprofessionals in the district substitute teachers, we can, um, you know, have people reach out to me. Talk a little bit about mentoring and induction and onboarding. Um, we've had a robust new teacher orientation and mentoring program for years. This year we have two new mentor coordinators, um, Marie Janiak, who had been in the, done the position for a long time, retired at the end of last year. And so we hired two new people, one for pre-K to five, one for six to 12. Um, that's Dory Polizzi for pre-K to five and Melissa Heath for grade six to 12. And they are really taking the lead on, uh, have, you know, uh, overseeing the mentoring program. Mentors have been matched. Um, and when new teachers come in, we're mentor they're working with the curriculum directors and the principals to match them. Um, new hire orientation was in person this year. It was last year too, but it was pretty, uh, we use the high school for part of it, the new high school space. We use Gibbs for part of it. Um, and again, you know, the mentoring program continues all year. Our onboarding process, which is really getting uh, new staff the paperwork they need to make sure they get paid and get into the retirement system and get the benefits they need is uh, done mostly online now. We've been using DocuSign for a couple of years. We are switching soon to a new program. Um, of uh, employee records on our one of our uh, 
talented uh, platforms. Um, Kelly in our office, Kali in my office, and Deb Weinstein in the superintendent's office have really done the bulk of the work on the onboarding of paperwork. And then our payroll department um, works very hard to make sure that everyone gets into our MUNIS system, gets, gets paid correctly. Um, and everyone up here on the sixth floor and in the schools and throughout the district works really hard to make sure that we get the new staff um, onboarded. I mean, from beginning with the interview teams in the schools, every, the teachers who take time out of, of their summers sometimes or after school to, to serve on interview teams and the principals and, and other staff, uh, and, then, um, and then everybody on, this, on the sixth floor and throughout the district who gets the people onboarded. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about resignations. So we did have, uh, you know, quite a few resignations this year. I don't think we had more than in previous years, but I will say some of the, I want to highlight some of the reasons um, people do leave. One is moving away from the area. People have, we have had people leave the state. They get jobs in other states or their spouses or partners do and they leave. Um, that happens. Sometimes we had a few people in that um, category. We had several people who moved far enough away from the Arlington area where it wouldn't have been feasible for them to continue working here. And one of the reasons they moved away was because of um, they could afford to buy a house farther out, either farther north toward New Hampshire or farther south toward Rhode Island or in Rhode Island. Um, so we have had some of that happen this year. Mm -hmm. um, there are other people who have already lived far enough away and had long commutes. And for the past couple of years, the commutes weren't so bad with the number of people actually on the roads. And now it's like a real normal, like what it used to be, mm -hmm. commute in the Boston area. So it's harder for people to take the time. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, got that. Uh, sorry. It's harder for people to take the time to, um, um, to you know, spend the time in the car. And we did have a few people leave because of that. Um, we've had some people pr have professional moves within education. Some people have left, um, you know, because they become teachers in other districts where they were paraprofessionals here. They get teaching jobs in other districts. Sometimes there's lateral teacher moves um, in a, to other districts, um, and sometimes it's becoming an administrator in other districts. And at times it's increased compensation. We did make some improvements in our contracts this year. Thank you to the committee and. Uh, Dr. Homan and Mr. Mason for working really hard to do that for a lot of, and we successfully settled our contracts. And even with that improvement, there are other districts also made improvements in their contracts. And so it's hard sometimes to keep up with that. So um, there are challenges that we will have. Um, you know, there is, this has been a very tough few years for educators. There is some burnout for people. There are some people who have left teaching. I did talk to a few people who decided they just, they needed to do something else. Um, um, and there are personal family reasons that for people, you know, their family situations changed and they needed to take, um, do something else or, or change um, the career um, for that reason. We can go to the next. Um, current vacancies, um, you know, we have special education teachers. Special education, I will say, is a national issue and statewide, definitely, of where we have some some vacancies and other districts do as well. Um, we are finalizing a hire for the high school um, and Audison, and we are working still with some vacancies at Gibbs and Dallin. Um, we have a part-time Italian teacher vacancy. School nurse has been a challenging, school nurses have been tough also throughout the state. Um, paraprofessionals, again, it's, an, it's again, we are having challenges. Everyone is having challenges with this. As I mentioned, crossing guards we need, food service, and substitutes. So those are some of the vacancies um, that, are, that are sort of the, the ones that we kind of really need to fill. We are functioning well as a district. I think I want to thank our administrators and the, the teachers and paraprofessionals we do have for working really hard. I know sometimes we don't have substitute coverage. And I know at Audison, they, you know, teachers step up and cover during their preps. And they get a little extra money for that, but it's, you know, it's very helpful that they, that they do that. Um, and um, so that goes to the vacancies. I'm gonna move on to some of our data. So what we, w one of the um, 
reasons we have had a goal of increasing the diversity of our staff for years is because our students are increasingly diverse and we want our students to both see themselves in the teachers and other staff in front of them and you know it's the windows and, and mirrors um, that we've heard about so much so we want that our staff overall I mean our students overall are more diverse than our staff overall especially our teaching staff um, so you can see the student data um, with the percentages of, or the numbers of, of students um, who identify as black or African American, American Indian, Asian, Hispanic, <coughs> Native Hawaiian, um, two or more races, and white. Um, if we go to the all employee um, slide, the next one, um, if you can see the numbers there, um, we are, um, you know, Primarily, um, you know, 70, uh, <coughs> let me just see that, 78% white staff, which is a, a much higher percentage than our students. Um, if we go to the new hires, which is the next hmm. slide, it's about 71.67% white. So we are more diverse with our newer hires that we've hired since last year. Um, so that is a trend um, where we have been able to add some, some diversity to our staff. I'm going to go to um, some of the, uh, the different units we have. So the AAA is a small unit. Um, you know, there are small numbers of um, uh, overall. Um, and so there are some higher percentages of non-white uh, administrators in the district, BIPOC administrators in the district. And one of the things that is, um, you know, we've, we have added um, more BIPOC administrators in the past couple of years. And the hope is, I mean, I think all of our administrators have an interest in increasing the diversity of their staff. And I think BIPOC administrators will have, um, will have a lens that some of our white administrators don't and will hopefully will lead to more diverse, uh, diverse hiring. Um, our AEA Unit A staff, um, which is mostly is our, all of our teachers, related service providers, um, and some other uh, professional, licensed professional um, staff, is about 87.9% white with, um, you know, other percentages of, um, you know, of BIPOC staff, lower percentages of BIPOC staff. There is also one of the things that you'll see in these slides, and we've talked about this before, is there is a significant number of staff who are not self-identified. Mm -hmm. So we've changed our forms in the past couple of years through, um, you know, with our system that Kelly and has, has sort of led, is um, it's, there's a, the form where you um, identify, you have the choice to identify or not, is a required form. You have to fill out that form whether you identify as one of these um, racial categories, but there's also a choice that you choose, affirmatively choose not to self-identify, and that's a choice that, that people make, that they do not want to self-identify. Um, the next slide is our Unit C, which is uh, our administrative assistants and office specialists. Um, that's a smaller unit as well. Um, so it's you know, primarily white, but there is some, um, some BIPOC uh, administrative assistants and office specialists in there. Uh, paraprofessionals is more diverse. It gets closer to mirroring our student uh, data. So although there is still a high percentage of non-identified there, um, but we have um, hired more paraprofessionals who are uh, by pocket. And then we moved to principal central office IT um, and our after school program is the next one where we have our after school program and daycare have had um, attracted more diverse candidates um, for years um, for a lot of reasons and um, they are able to hire um, and attract uh, diverse candidates. And maintenance, transportation, food service, um, there's a high percentage not self-identified in that category. Um, and then we have sort of the breakdown of Arlington students and staff by ethnicity, and you can sort of see the comparison 
um, between what the students is, are and then so several of the units and new hires. So that hopefully will show you at least how we're trending a little bit the last year or so. And then I want to talk a little bit about our next steps. So um, we are, you know, as, you, as you know, we're involved in strategic planning and I think Dr. Hummel will probably update you on strategic planning later. Um, so um, strategic planning group two is uh, valuing all staff and we are working um, Margaret Creel Thomas, Julie Keyes, um, another teacher um, from the Audison Cesar is, who's a math teacher, is on that group. Um, we are developing our strategies for retention of staff um, and recruitment of staff. But one of the things we're looking for is you saw the paraprofessional data. We're trying to look for ways to provide pathways for licensure to paraprofessionals um, if they desire to become a licensed teacher. Um, one of the other things we're talking about and Dr. McNeil has worked on uh, this year is really creating really uh, meaningful professional development for all our staff. And we think that's going to help, um, you know, help, bo help retain staff. Um, Dr. Janger uh, talked in his presentation about belonging and engagement both for students and for staff. And that's something that Margaret Cradle Thomas and I are working on um, to increase those kinds of opportunities for engagement both in terms of recruitment and retention and one of the things we're going to um, be doing is meeting with all of our new educators to check in on them and see how their experience is and really what how can we improve that experience um, for educators in Arlington and so that's that's um, a couple of the things we're we're doing um, to sort of look at the these areas to see how we can keep the staff we have and um, and recruit new staff that's the presentation. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Thanks. Um, so I, I guess, I don't know if you track the data, but for the teachers that are resigning, do we track their their race, their, their identity? Uh, we, do, yeah, I don't have those okay. slides, but we, we do. I mean, it's primarily, um, yeah, it, we, we do. It's Okay, because that would be, because, Margaret Kudup Thomas expressed the yeah. fear that we were losing BIPOC teachers, but the question is, are we losing them disproportionately, right? Yeah. So they're, if they're only, I don't know what percentage they are of the, of the, of the unit, um, uh, you know, if they're 40%, if they're, sorry, if they're like 10% of the unit, for example, but they're 20% of the resignations, mm -hmm. then there's a problem that we've identified. Yeah, I don't think that would think be useful that's information. It. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, right. Um, Mr. Hainer. Going along with uh, Dr. Carden's uh, question, those people that are resigning, say it was disproportionate, it was 20, is it possible, can you find out if they're leaving for compensation? Because if it's a compensation thing, rather than uh, an issue in the, in the community, okay. it, it's important to know. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Mr. Thielen. <clears throat> um, just back from the concert downstairs, they're doing a great job, by the way. Um, <clears throat> my question is, have you ever done a study of those who stay in the district? So that's something um, we have not. And I think other than our panorama data, I think, I think the panorama data may be um, something that is sort of a study of current staff um, and some of the things that we've seen from that data. Um, so in terms of just the surveys we've done, but we, um, uh, in terms of, and I, we haven't done that kind of, uh, other than that. Because I've found actually that yeah. sometimes that <clears throat> analysis yeah. determines, it tells you a lot actually, it, could, it tells you some things you might not want to know, but yeah. actually to, to understand who stays and why they stay informs <clears throat> Sometimes it informs who you want to recruit, mm -hmm. but it depends on what that yeah, yeah. group looks like. And then it also informs what you need to do to change to get people to stay sure. sometimes. Yeah. So that's all. Yeah. Mr. Hainer. I just want to say how much I appreciate what Mr. Spiegel and his entire staff does. And, he, and, and to his credit, he does a tremendous amount of work 
and acknowledges the people around him. But he owns a lot of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the report. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for being here. Oh, Dr. Hellman, did you want? I just wanted to echo everybody's thank you. Um, thank Mr. Spiegel for holding down the fort this week while we're all absent. And also for all the analysis that he's done and the work on strategic planning because the, um, the team that he is on is really heavily focused on making sure we do value all staff. And we've had a lot of conversations about how to make these data um, more visible to the community, easier to track, um, easier for his office to track. So, and I know that he's thinking a lot about that. And so thank you very much for your thorough work on this, Mr. Spiegel. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to go to the superintendent's evaluation. And so there are two parts to this um, agenda item. Dr. Homan is going to present her um, materials to us. And then I would like us to have a, just a brief conversation about um, the document that will be used for us to complete the evaluation and the date that you will have it ready so that I can put it all together. Um, so Dr. Homan, you can start with your materials, please. Thank you. So in your materials, you have a link to a website that has my evaluation materials in it, as well as a little bit of explanation for how this is organized. Um, I won't speak at length about this. You have the materials, um, except to say that there is an additional section at the top um, called student outcomes, where I've included both the outcomes report to the school committee that you received at the last meeting, as well as an additional achievement and opportunity gap analysis based on the feedback that we received on that report at the last meeting. Um, there was expressed in that conversation an interest in us sort of formatting things the way the state does with relative to gap analysis. And we are more than happy to do that um, moving forward, but didn't quite have the time to do additional analysis on top of what we've already done. And so hopefully this uh, provides a little bit more context and information about how gaps have been trending across some of our focal groups over the last several years. Um, it is worth when you look at some of those graphs, which I'll pull up, um, <clears throat> taking a look not only at, Lon, while I flip through, taking a look not only at um, the trend over from 2017 to 2022, but also just what has happened between 2021 and 2022, um, because in some of those instances, you might notice that a gap that was getting wider maybe closed a little bit more in the last year or so, um, or at least from 2021 to 2022. But as Dr. McNeil reported, our um, outcomes demonstrated typical growth in ELA, um, more high growth in mathematics, particularly at the middle school level. And um, you can take a look at that gap analysis to see more on that. I mostly included achievement gap analysis because gaps with growth are a little odd to display in the way that I have these graphs displayed. Um, but I'm happy to talk more about growth or Dr. McNeil can at a later meeting if you'd like. I also included chronic absenteeism analysis that you received at your last meeting with the outcomes report, some accountability reports by district and school, as well as our panorama surveys from the last administration. Um, would love to have the current years up there, but like I said, we're doing that in November. Um, there are goals and evidence, and this is taken from the formative assessment and updated. So there's a lot of information in here um, and a lot of it is new or updated. So if the text is green, that means that's new since the formative assessment in February. If the text is blue like this, it means I've just added new artifacts or new evidence to that um, document or folder. And if the text is black, it means there hasn't been a change. Um, we still only have the 21-22 school improvement plans in this folder because we're still in the process of collecting and presenting those to you. And the goals remain the same from the start of last school year. There are three district improvement goals and a professional practice goal. There's a new summative reflection on this page um, and the standard indicators are the same ones that I chose uh, when I first began. And other than that, I don't have much more to report. If there are questions about navigation, certainly don't hesitate to reach out and i um, happy to answer any questions about what's there if you have them. Thank you, Dr. Homan. Are there questions about <clears throat> Dr. Homan's materials? No. Okay. Oh. There, there are some <laughs> access issues, but um, we can work with Liz on that. 
Please dig in on that. Okay. All right. Um, so my understanding is that Mr. Cardin is working on a document that we will each fill in and it will be ready early next week. Yeah. Did you receive that? Yes. Draft? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yes. okay. Um, and we are, it's, we're scheduled to, to present the evaluation to Dr. Holman um, at the November 17th school committee meeting. Mm -hmm. So I would like to request that all of you have your um, evaluations finished on November 10th. Does that feel like something that you all, Mr. Hainer, do you want? I just want to understand, are we going to be presenting our individual ones or are we going to send them to you for your presentation? Is that part of the discussion tonight? Um, we can discuss that. My in the past, it's, the chair has put that all together, and that is what I'm expecting that I will do. The one that goes to Desi is a compilation that, yeah. you, that you are required to do. If I, you would like to, I've experienced doing straight narratives, forms, individual together. It's never been consistent. So, That's the problem. so Mr. Carn is is creating or, or is using a state form right. that he's going to share with all of us. Right that we will, each member will fill in and share with me, and then I will consolidate it for Desi. If you would like to read from your um, narrative at the meeting. It's an option. It's an option. Thank you. Do you want to add anything, Mr. Carn? No, no, no. I was going to ask for a little bit more clarity about how you're going to present the evaluation. So you're going to present the... The summative the form, which my, my understanding is that if there's, you know, seven proficients, it says seven under yeah. a mm -hmm. thing, and if mm -hmm. there's one needs improvement, and then I'll ha the narrative I'll have to, I know some have sort of taken blurbs from each person. I'm open to <coughs> your feedback yeah, I, on that. I don't, care what you, yeah, I don't care what you do in writing. I just, okay. If you can tell us, mm -hmm. once you see them maybe on the 10th, if you can tell us like how you're going, to, what you're going to present, then we can evaluate if we want to add to it okay. instead of doing it on the fly. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Just clarification. Yep. On the tenth, you want me, me emailing you? Where should we have them? Go to Miss Diggins and then me. You're yes, you're email them to me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. Anything else? Dr. Homan, does that all feel okay mm -hmm. for you? Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. Oh, boy, I lost notice here. Ooh. Sorry, everybody. Okay. Um, monthly financial report, Mr. Mason. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, Tonight, for you had for your review, um, you had the monthly financial, financial reports for the third period of fiscal 23. Um, this report reflects expenditures in our financial system as of September 30th, 2022. Um, this report includes um, the reports for the general fund, the grants, um, COVID-19 um, related grants, as well as select revolving funds um, and special revenue funds. Um, <clears throat> once again, the first report um, is the general fund report. What you may notice is that the general fund report is not much different from the last report that I provided because, you know, the last report I provided you up to date um, expenditures um, due to the encumbrances that was updated in the system, which was September 22nd, 2022. Um, a pull of the data. Um, and so due to the timing of our accounts payable warrants and payroll warrants, the figures are not necessarily sustain substantially different. Um, the report for period ending October 31st, 2022 will be much different and should be have a better viewing of where we stand. Um, currently the projected formula assumes that departments will spend their budgets down to zero. Um, so the current projected balance, which is very unlikely, is currently around 2 million, which was the same um, dollar amount in the previous formula, and that was reported in the last month. 
Uh, the excess was tied um, to some unfilled positions at the time and uh, salary changes for selected bargaining groups that had not posted to the ledger at that time and budget alignments that still needed to happen that have happened after September uh, 30th. The, re the report also um, includes uh, normal grant spending, which the spending is um, going according to the plan. Um, our COVID-19 grants, we do have some funds available in SR3, um, which we hope to have an adjusted spending plan to propose to the, at the next budget subcommittee meeting. In addition, um, I will be working with uh, Allison Elmer, the Assistant Superintendent of Student Services, and our grant administrator on the other ARPA-related special education grants. Uh, there, those do have some balances as well. And last but not least, you will find the normal special revenue and development fund support. Um, and I do not have anything to note at this point in time. Still waiting for a certified circuit breaker amount for revenue purposes. Um, but however, spending is going as planned. Any questions or comments for Ms. Jamison? Mr. Flickman? Yeah, I mean, the follow up is going to show us where we're off in terms of salaries based on the uh, lane changes and, and uh, unfilled positions, right? Because what I'm looking at right now shows us on target. Mr. Mason, did you hear that question? Mm -hmm. Um, I did not necessarily clearly hear a question. I'm, I'm not sure if it's a question or a statement. No, uh, I, I'm, I'm just clarifying that right now we can't tell the differential between what we projected for salaries <clears throat> and what we've expended, <clears throat> and that a subsequent report will give us a sense of where we are on, on the salary line item uh, given those changes, right? That is. That is correct. In the future report, you'll we'll have a better understanding where the salary line items are, would be at, as well as any adjustments that were made to accommodate any new positions. Yeah, that was what I was uh, looking for, and I I'm glad I'm glad to have it. Hope hope all is well with you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Mason will now present us with the end of year financial report. Okay. Um, and everybody can hear me, correct? I'm just mm -hmm. yeah. concerned yeah. the setup here. We're trying to prevent feedback uh, as we sit next to each other here. So sorry if there's some, we're giving side looks here to make sure everything is good. So, um, so also submitted for your review was a, prelim uh, was a preliminary end of year report expense summary for fiscal uh, 22. So this was for the period of July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022. Um, before going any further, I just want to thank uh, first Jose Farias, the school accountant. He, this is the first year that he actually did nearly most of the, the drafting of this report. Um, and, you know, for producing this report, it's a, it's a lot of work, which included working with uh, special education business manager, Andrea Campbell, and gathering special education and transportation data. Um, it also required, you know, Jose kind of herding the cats, so to speak, by requesting and gathering information from the town departments on school-related spending on the town side. In addition to going through over 4,000 different accounts that we have on our, on our financial ledger. Um, please note that in the memo that I provided, there's some comparative information of the years of what was reported to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, every year, we have to actually send or have an audit done on the actual report and send that over to DESE, which we also do share with this committee. Um, the report has been clean for the last few years, and so, but when drafting this report, we noticed uh, something and that you would likely notice on this report that the total spending is actually reflected as lower um, over from the prior year, which is about 5.29%. And so after further researching and reconciling, um, I did not wanna change the actual numbers that were on the memo because that's what we actually reported to DESE. Um, the reported number for fiscal 22 the number that we just reported is correct. 
uh, due to instructions on how to report the MSBA construction projects on the end of the year report provided um, at a recent DESE training, um, we realized that our prior reports were over-reporting the, the high school project expenditures, meaning we were reporting expenditures in fiscal 20 and fiscal 21 based on what we were incurring on the books, not necessarily based on when we were paying down a, a debt, and that's what's supposed to be reported on the end of year report. And so in, real, in reality, um, the fiscal 20 and fiscal 21 periods reflect about $2.6 million and $16.9 million of additional spending. So which in result, if you was to actually back those numbers out of the reported uh, numbers, the year over, it would be a year over year increase of spending of about $9.6 million but when you compare fiscal 22 spending to fiscal 21, which was an 8% increase. Um, the total spending in fiscal 21 um, would have been uh, around 121 million after us catching this. And so I, I say this because the auditors do audit these items and there was something that Desi wanted to make sure that all districts were aligned and that some districts were not actually, they, there was no um, consistent way of reporting the expenditures. Um, the other tables besides the town expenditures um, that needs to be, that would be slightly overstated. Everything else is correct. So the year over year change on the school committee appropriated funds um, was mainly driven around the reduction of our out of district tuition and transportation spending, um, which was due to age outs and overall less students being sent to out of district schools on an aggregate basis, which is uh, the cause of the reduction of about $1.3 million that you would notice in the variance on that table. Um, also note that town expenditures uh, sh show a report category, which once again is driven by a pivot table, which I um, didn't, did not catch, but, catch, but the town does not pay for special education tuition. That is actually the regional school assessment, which you will receive an updated memo and it will be posted online with also the notes of the, the, um, the construction adjustment. Um, our, our grant expenditures remain pre-level uh, due to how we have rolled out and scheduled our COVID-19 grant spending because that's the total grant spending that's there. Um, the grant spending is uh, still elevated when you're comparing to grant spending prior to COVID-19. Um, and this will likely be a continued trend for fiscal 23 um, and will probably fall off for fiscal 24. The last summary that was on that memo, you will see that is reports um, on the, 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 the final pages of columns five through 10, excluding column six, which was private grants. So this would include circuit breaker, tuition and user fees, which would include monotony preschool, music lessons, daycare, foreign exchange tuition, also as athletics, school, um, school lunch and other local receipts, which include community education and building rentals. And so overall spending has increased for, for the special revenue by about 40%. Some of that's, um, which is about nearly about $3 million year over year. And some of that is uh, driven by increase in spending in our facility projects, as well as we had increased utilities last year for the new high school. Um, some of that was covered by the project the rest of them had to be covered by our operating budget, which included the special revenue uh, funds, and um, which was charged to the building rentals. And also, um, you'd notice that lunches, um, the lunch food services has also increased due to, be, due to, due to the, the reasoning is that, you know, um, you know, lunch has been free uh, during during the pandemic and it's still be, um, being covered as free and even in fiscal 23. So the food service expenditures are also up due to the increased participation of the, the food programming. And you also notice that pupil services has increased back to a level prior to fiscal 21, which that's representing community yet and out of the school program, um, which are now back running in person um, in fiscal 22. So uh, I would end my my recap of uh, fiscal 22 spending there and open up to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. 
Thanks. I was just going to suggest to Dr. Allison Ampey that maybe we, at budget, take a, a closer look into the this uh, spending report and the um, changes that Michael was describing. Anything else? Mr. Slickman? Just in terms of the changes in the spending you described and the reduction as a result, uh, I assume we're not going to run into a net school spending issue with DESE as a result of the way we've changed our reporting. Um, I first, I haven't consulted with Department of Elementary and Secondary Education yet um, about what we found internally, uh, but it would not be an effect to the next school spending because this is actually the city town uh, spending side and mm -hmm. tied to a non net school spending item, which is construction. Okay. Dr. Allison Ampey. This is to Mr. Carden. Uh, yeah, I had the exact same thought, so yes, it will be. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Thank you, everyone. All right, superintendent's update, Dr. Homan. Give me one minute to share slides. Okay, so starting with strategic planning updates, we are starting community forums next week on November 2nd. Those will run through um, December 8th. Seats are limited to 50 participants per forum and are formatted, as I've mentioned before, as interactive workshops. The forums are designed to share our mission and vision, equity audit recommendations, and gather input and feedback on initiatives which the teams are hungry to receive and are looking forward to see receiving. Um, the forums will take place in the evening. All staff are providing initiative feedback on November 8th. And when I say all, I do mean all. We have it baked right into our professional development day to make sure that we're getting feedback from staff. Students have been invited and are encouraged um, by the AHS Student Council to participate as well. Uh, we moved back uh, AHS Student Council meeting time so that they could attend one of the meetings. Um, and we also have posted the flyer around. We have a different flyer for the kids. Um, highlighting that they can get community service hours if they participate in one of these. The last forum is going to be virtual and the seats are filling up, which is great. And we're really looking forward to hosting these and speaking with the community and hearing from them about what, what our work has been so far. I wanted to give you a bit of a preview as well um, on the initiatives and sort of where they stand. I, I share this with you with the caveat that these are exceptionally drafty because like I said, we're about to go get four five, six rounds of feedback on them. Um, initiative priority area one group is working on ensuring equity and excellence. Right now they have two initiatives that they are working on that will be shared with the community. The first set of forums, they're probably going to have a third, but we're not sharing that one out yet because they're still working on it. Um, one is focused on ensuring that we assess our intervention services and assessment practices and in order to make sure that we're developing a multi-tiered system of support that includes robust uh, tier two intervention at all levels. I think something we've certainly heard is that it's not always clear what constitutes tier two, when a student is receiving it, um, what sort of reports families can expect on various assessments that we do throughout the district, why we do various assessments throughout the district, and an MTSS plan would enable us to do that um, and to enact it effectively. Another initiative that they are looking at is a definition and implementation of strong, cohesive, and equitable core curricular, tier one curriculum practice um, with instructional practice that builds all students' capabilities. They're really looking at um, deeper learning approaches to learning, making sure that we are in, you know, in thinking about belonging, we're actually not just thinking about how do students feel when they're in school, but understanding belonging as tied to what happens in the classroom during academic time. And so the administrative team has been thinking a lot about what does engagement really look like? It was actually a lengthy conversation at our conference today. Um, and what do we mean when we say, excellent? what does excellent instruction mean when we say it in Arlington? So that's what that 1B um, is really focused on, is, is making sure that we define that and then put the resources in place to ensure that we can do it. Um, initiative two, valuing all staff, is looking at three initiatives right now. One is to create and sustain pipeline programs for paraprofessionals, students, and interns in order to um, meet our diversification goals. 
Another is to reimagine professional development in response to staff needs to continue reimagining it. We know we've done some work on that this year, but there's more to be done. Um, and ensuring that all aspects of compensation are more competitive um, when compared to area cities and towns is part of our retention efforts. A third initiative, or our priority three initiatives at the moment, these are focused on infrastructure operations and sustainability. One is to sustain inclusive and modern schools and to do work to identify what we mean by that, what a modern school requires in terms of maintenance, um, what a modern school has in terms of spaces, and where some of our constraints are currently in the system and what we would hope to see in future planning. Another is focused on our food nutrition programs. We're thrilled that we have had the ability to feed all students breakfast, expand our breakfast program, and feed all students lunches. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're providing food that is nourishing to the body so that we have very healthy students in class um, who have been nourished and whose brains are ready to do some, some heavy lifting. So that is what that one is focused on. Um, 3C is focused on enhancing school experiences through facility renovation, reconfiguration, and redesign. Um, that includes taking a look at the Audison, but also taking a look at some of our other facilities and what they might need in order to be um, inclusive and modern. Priority area four um, under sustaining collaborative partnerships are focused on three initiatives, one of which is clear, accessible, and consistent communication for and with families across the district with a focus on that two-way partnership and communication, um, and improved welcoming and onboarding of new students and families to APS, making sure that we have spaces where they can get all of the resources they need, where they can safely enter the system and know where to go if they have any questions along the way. And 4C is about improved access to care and enrichment services. That includes after school care and before school care, but also all of the services that we might be able to provide to students external to the school day when it comes to academics. So I'm thinking about what we might be able to do more of. So those, those are previews. Don't ask me too many in-depth questions about them. The teams know way more than I do. And we're really looking forward to getting some feedback from community members on what they would hope to see in any one of these initiatives, what they feel like is missing from any one of these initiatives. Um, and we'll use that to keep building them out and making them more detailed and clear to the community. So that's the preview. Um, a quick playground update. Uh, Stratton's rubber surfacing started this week where they're hoping to schedule inspection for next week, which would enable them to open in early November. Uh, all, we're all hands on deck at Pierce at that point because the construction company's workers will be able to focus their attention on Pierce, which started its construction later. Um, the anticipated opening for this is still mid-November, and we're hoping we'll be able to stick to that, and Bishop opened uh, earlier in October. And a few additional updates. Um, the fall play is coming up on November 4th and 5th. It will be in the new AHS auditorium. They are performing a Midsummer Night's Dream, and I'm very much looking forward to this. It'll be our first play in the new auditorium, and uh, I hear that tickets are selling quickly. November is feedback month in the district. We will be asking families and students, as Dr. Janger said, um, and staff to weigh in and let us know how things are going so far this year. We're really looking forward to administering the same surveys that we did last fall so that we have some comparative measures. Um, it's possible we may tweak measures here and there from year to year, but for the most part, we really wanna see what it's like to do two rounds and see what kind of impact we had over the past year with some of the work that we've been doing. Um, there's also an annual town survey that is launched each year and they have, they're working on it now and have asked us, our town side colleagues, um, if we have any items that we would like to include on the annual town survey. So I mentioned that in case any committee members or community members have any input on what we might want to ask on the annual town survey, you can certainly reach out to me um, separate from this meeting and let me know what your thoughts are about things that we might wanna know um, from the electorate. And uh, OMS cross country team is starting to wrap up their season. This is their second season, if you recall. We just started this team last year. There are 38, this is pretty amazing for a team that's brand new. Um, there are 38 runners on the Audison cross country team. Uh, they competed in eight meets and one invitational during the season. As of October 25th, both the girls and boys teams uh, were three and three and they have two more meets to go. Uh, they've been determined, um, they've shown sportsmanship in their practices, and the runners and coaches would like to express their gratitude to APS for funding this team and making it possible. I had the opportunity to go for a run with them the other day, and they are fast, 
and they mm -hmm. run fast up hills, which mm. is tough on me. I'm too old for that. So <laughs> they, uh, they wore me out and it was a lot of fun. And we have also a couple of programs running that I'll be sharing with families later this week, um, hopefully tomorrow, the holiday help program. Um, and I also wanted to thank uh, members of our community for chipping in to provide short-term housing placements to some of our students this past week. Um, we really appreciate the community support in the holiday help program, which is run by Health and Human Services to provide families with addition, who need uh, additional support over the holidays to provide gifts to their children, as well as families who have um, stepped up to help children who need housing placements recently. Um, this is a wonderful town to work in because people are so willing to step up and help out. So thank you all. And your enrollments are in your packet. And one last update, this is brand new. Um, our branding is done. And I'm sorry, Mr. Schlickman, there's not a duck, but I hope that it looks more like a pond. Um, we gave them all, we, we did a full survey of all the staff. We also asked um, uh, our staff members and community members for a little bit more feedback. A lot of people shared some of the same things you did. They liked the tree, but they liked the circle as a concept. They couldn't quite see that there was a pond in the picture. They couldn't quite see that there was a Minuteman path there. And so we've emphasized several elements of some of our original ones that we shared with you in order to make some of those things clearer. This is done and will be posted on the website soon and we will have the ability to update letterheads and other district level sorts of things and put some new um, graphics on the central, the new central office wall uh, that mar matches our new branding. So I wanted to provide that update too. And with that, I'll take any questions that you have. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hellman. Um, next, we have <clears throat> a resolution um, from the Gas Leaks Task Force for us to discuss. Um, so David Morgan um, emailed Ms. Diggins and she shared this with all of us um, that they have, the. Town Manager's Gas Leaks Task Force um, has written a resolution um, requesting that Nas National Grid commit to a schedule for fixing the significant environmental impact methane leaks in Arlington, of which there are 14, and many are in close proximity to Arlington schools. Um, so the task force is asking if the school committee would be willing to endorse the resolution before they present it to the select board. So I have agreed to bring it here to the committee for consideration. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, I move endorsement. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Schlickman, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Any discussion? Okay. Um, roll call vote. Mr. Hainer. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes, that's unanimous. Um, the school committee will sign on to this resolution. Okay, consent to get that. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 23079, dated October 18th, 2022, in the amount of $418,908.62. School Committee Meeting Minutes, October 13th, 2022. School Committee Meeting Minutes, October 20th, 2022. Updated job description for Assistant Food Service Director. So move. <coughs> Second. We have a motion by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Schlickman. Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes, that's unanimous. Okay, sorry everybody. Subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. Um, we will be meeting next week and we will add the things that were already mentioned to our agenda. Thank you. Community relations, Mr. Hainer? Nothing to report at this time. You're not gonna share our conversation about subcommittee meetings? I would, uh, I. No, okay. I'm nervous, I, I, I don't know if the superintendent was. Okay. 
I'll share it. I'll share it. Um, on election day. Uh, oh no, sorry. I, the no, we had the door meeting. monitor. Oh, sorry. I apologize. The uh, the thing that the school committee asked the community relations uh, to look into about floor monitor. We were asking all subcommittee members to try to do it during regular school time. If that can't be done, a, a monitor will be assigned to the front door for that meeting. And Can it's the responsibility of the chair of the subcommittee to let Ms. Diggins know that that is something that needs to happen. With sufficient time to get a monitor if, they, if it's not during school time. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Curriculum instruction assessment and accountability, Ms. Morgan. Um, can I ask a question about that? But yeah. if, if we set the meeting time and it's not during school time, like we're going to, we, we then also write to Ms. Diggins and say, hi, Ms. Diggins, I just set a meeting. Well, with, I mean, I don't know, right? I, what? I, I would suggest that you come up with a meeting before setting it, check with her so she has the available. Okay. Make sure she has it. I don't think there's going to be a problem. Uh, the, 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 I think the piece too is that there are some nights where the, door is already going to right. have a monitor because there is a different event going on. And so there's the piece of clarifying, do, does Ms. Diggins need to get a door monitor or will there be one there? And the discussion was around Dr. Holman, like Dr. Holman should not be responsible for no. that. So I just- Thank you, I'm sorry. The, the chair of the subcommittee should confirm that a door monitor is needed and that someone is looking to do it. Yeah, the only thing I wanna add is Dr. Holman said, who's on the call, <laughs> that there will not be an issue in filling that seat. So there'll always be someone, so you can always find someone to sit there. <clears throat> Adorable. Right. I'm not commenting, Paul. <laughs> the IAA, Ms. Morgan. We met uh, this week. We talked about the overnight experience. We talked about elementary literacy, and we talked about strategic planning. Uh, I have not written minutes. Uh, the overnight experience, the, uh, they are working to connect with um, teachers and staff and administrators at the Gibbs to evaluate options for this year. Uh, they're going to come back to us uh, November 13th when we meet again, which I, is that before we meet here again? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yikes. Uh, November 14th. So we're going to meet on November 14th at 8.30. We're going to get an update on planning for an overnight experience. Um, we're also going to talk about SLC programming at the Gibbs. We had a great presentation from Dr. McNeil about the elementary literacy work. Um, and I'm excited for him to bring an update on that to the full committee probably sometime before we have to actually vote on the recommendation that they're going to bring to us so um maybe like january february time frame um so yeah but it was it was a great meeting so cia next time is, is the 14th at 8 30. cia next time is uh at 8 20 actually um and we will be talking about overnight experience update uh SLC at the Gibbs and strategic planning update. 820. That's really be there or be square. <laughs> She's trying to avoid the crush at 830 yeah. arrival. Thank you. Yourself. All right. Facilities, <clears throat> Mr. Thielman. No report. Policies and procedures, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, we, if you're on the policies and procedures committee, be alert for Liz Degan's, uh, query on meeting times. We have enough to, uh, stuff on the potential agenda for which to have another meeting. Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Th uh, Thielman. We meet Monday the 1st at uh, 6 p.m. And the superintendent evaluation, Mr. Cardin. Uh, we are hopefully done for this year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, liaison reports, Ms. Morgan. 
Uh, I uh, am on the wellness committee. I'm the wellness committee liaison, and I believe for many years that was not a group that meets, but this year uh, we're meeting six times. <laughs> <laughs> because they're taking on a whole like Desi led uh, overhaul of various things. So I'm psyched about that. Uh, one thing that is of note for this group, specifically Mr. Schlickman, is that they are looking at the wellness policy in quite a lot of detail um, and we'll be making some recommendations to the policy. I guess it's gonna have to come to the policy subcommittee mm -hmm. when they come up with something. Um, so there was a lot of conversation and I encouraged them to ensure that anything they put in the policy was something they intended to do and was not going to be in any way aspirational um, and that having goals and mm -hmm. aspirations is fantastic, but we need to have our policies need to be what we're going to do. So, uh, yeah, we're meeting uh, monthly, I believe. Thank you. Yep. So there's probably <laughs> another meeting before we come back here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, any other liaison reports? Sounds so exciting. <laughs> uh, announcement? Mr. Slickman. Just sort of, uh, we, we had a school committee chat uh, for METCO on the 24th, um, no, that's the wrong day. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, the 15th of October is when we had the uh, school committee chat for METCO, uh, and it was a beautiful day. It was 70 degrees, it was sunny, and nobody wanted to sit by their computer. We did have one Arlington parent uh, pop in to ask about how can I support METCO do, do you need people to be uh, partners, you know, partner parents uh, with METCO? And so we directed her to the METCO director. But other than that, it was just too nice a day for people to be on Zoom. Thank you. Um, I, um, I wanted to read um, a modified version of an email the committee received this morning. I did change some or take out some details. Um, I wanted to take a, this is an email. I wanted to take a moment to recognize and share the incredible work of two Arlington Public School staff, a building principal and superintendent Elizabeth Homan. The department recently had a young child who was facing removal from their family late in the evening. Unfortunately, due to numerous circumstances that day, the department was hard pressed to find an appropriate foster home for them. After talking with the principal about a new targeted recruitment effort we had just begun to roll out in two other communities, I received a call from Dr. Holman, who agreed to partner with us and help send a message to school families eliciting their support for the child. By 9 p.m. that evening, we had an Arlington family who had come forward for the child and agreed to support them during this traumatic time. I have worked for the Department of Children and Families for 12 years. I currently serve as the area clinical manager in Arlington. So often in our work, we find educators, professionals, and other agencies nervous to partner with us. There is often hesitancy, bureaucracy, and plenty of reasons to say no, and they do, often. But last week, the principal said yes, and then Dr. Homan said yes, and together they helped a child find a safe and loving place to stay. I am forever grateful for their support to our children and our agency. They deserve an award. Um, signed Kate Butterfield, uh, licensed social, licensed clinical social worker, area clinical manager of the Arlington DCF office. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that, and I also wanted to thank and acknowledge Cindy Curran, who I understand also played an integral role in this process. Um, and as this committee and the schools talk a lot about belonging and growth and joy. Um, I think keeping a student in their community and in their school building helps to foster belonging and a student's availability for learning relies on a student feeling safe and secure. So I appreciate this principal, Dr. Holman and Ms. Coran's commitment to our students' physical and emotional well-being and congratulations on being recognized. Um, okay, I have, I also, um, oh, all right, that was an announcement. Future agenda items. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to just let the committee know that I, we've, we received the METCO updates and school committees are often going to the new METCO headquarters either to have a meeting or to visit. And so um, I reached out to Ms. Smith and Dr. Holman and just sort of expressed our 
my interest in uh, finding a way for the committee to, to have a trip to Nubian Square to see the new METCO headquarters. I just wanted to let you oh, all yeah, know that. Yeah. Um, okay, anybody else future agenda items? Um, there's just minutes to approve for executive session, so I'm open to moving that to the next meeting if someone would like to so move. adjourn the meeting. Move to adjourn. Second. I have to take a roll call vote. Motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Schlickman. Mr. Hainer. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. And I vote yes. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.